In this lecture, we're going to talk about angles and their measures. So, an angle is formed by two rays with a common vertex. One ray is called the initial side, that's where we start from, and the other ray is called the terminal side of the angle. The angle formed by the two rays is identified by showing the direction and amount of rotation from the initial side to the terminal side. If the rotation goes in the counterclockwise direction, the angle is positive, and if the rotation is clockwise, then the angle is negative. So let's consider this angle. We have an initial side and a terminal side, and there are two ways to get from one to the other. One way is to rotate counterclockwise, that's represented by alpha, and so that's a positive angle. The other way is to rotate clockwise, which is angle beta, and that's a negative angle. And just as a little side note, if the initial side is on the x-axis and the vertex is positioned at the origin of a coordinate axis system, then the angle is said to be in standard position. So the first way that we have to measure angles is using the unit of degrees. Keep in mind that one degree is equal to one three-sixtieth of a revolution. So that means there are 360 degrees in one complete revolution. And remember from geometry that a right angle measures 90 degrees and a straight angle equals 180 degrees. Now oftentimes in trigonometry we'll refer to something called the unit circle. So the unit circle is pictured here. Basically it's a circle that represents different angles throughout the rotation in the circle. So you see at the top of the circle we have our 90 degree right angle. On the left hand of the circle we have a 180 degree straight angle. And so we have 30, 45, 60, 120, 135, and 150 degrees in between those angles. So this represents some of the common angles that we're going to use in trigonometry. So let's look at a couple of examples dealing with angles measured in degrees. The first thing we want to do is we want to sketch or draw a 60 degree angle. So let's start by considering a 90 degree angle. That's our right angle. And so a 60 degree angle would not quite go all the way up. It would be about two thirds of the way up. So if we rotate the terminal side two thirds of the way between zero and 90, that would give us our 60 degree angle. And 60 degrees is one of the angles that's on the unit circle. So we could look that up to make sure that we're right. Next, we want to draw a 540 degree angle. Now, since 540 is bigger than 360, we know we're going to make at least one complete revolution, and we need to figure out how far above 360 we go. So 540 degrees equals 360 plus 180, so that means we will make one full revolution, and then we'll go an additional 180 degrees. So if we start with our initial ray, our initial side here, we're going to rotate it around completely once, so it'll come back to where it is, and then we're going to go an additional 180 degrees, which gives us a straight angle. Now, another way that we have to measure angles is in a measurement called radians. So we know already that one revolution is 360 degrees, but one revolution is also two pi radians. And when we talk about a right angle, which would be 90 degrees, a right angle measures pi over two radians. And our straight angle that was 180 degrees will equal pi radians. And again, if we look at the unit circle, most unit circles have both measures of degrees and radians. So if we look at the unit circle, we see that 45, a 45 degree angle is the same thing as an angle of pi over four radians. So let's look at an example dealing with angles measured in radians. For this example, we want to draw an angle that measures negative two pi over three radians. So we're gonna start with our initial side, and since the angle is negative, we're gonna rotate clockwise. And remember that pi over two would be a right angle, and two pi over three is bigger than pi over two, so we're gonna rotate down to be a right angle, and then go a little bit further to be two pi over three. So an angle that measures negative two pi over three radians would look something like this. Next, we want to talk about converting between degrees and radians. So we'll start by talking about conversion factors. One degree equals pi over 180 radians. So if we're converting from degrees to radians, we'll multiply by pi divided by 180. 
and 1 radian equals 180 divided by pi degrees so if we're converting from radians to degrees we'll multiply by this so let's do a few examples we want to convert 330 degrees into radians so we start with 330 degrees to convert to radians we'll multiply by pi divided by 180 if we multiply these together we get 330 pi divided by 180 we can cancel 30 from both the numerator and denominator to reduce to 11 pi over 6. All right, next we want to convert negative 225 pi into radians. I'd like for you to take a minute and see if you can do this following the example above. Once you finish, or if you get stuck, follow along with me. So we start with negative 225 degrees. To convert to radians, we'll multiply by pi divided by 180. When we do that multiplication, it gives us negative 225 pi over 180. We can cancel 45 out of both the numerator and denominator, which reduces our fraction to negative 5 pi over 4. All right, now let's go the other way. Let's convert negative 2 pi over 3 radians into degrees. We start with negative 2 pi over 3 radians. To convert to degrees, we multiply by 180 over pi. So if we simplify that multiplication, we get negative 360 pi over 3. Pi will cancel out from both the numerator and denominator. And if we take negative 360 divided by 3, that will give us negative 120. Let's convert negative 3 pi over 4 radians into degrees. Take a minute and try to do this by yourself. If you get stuck or when you finish, feel free to follow along with me. So, we start with negative 3 pi over 4 radians. To convert to degrees, we'll multiply by 180 over pi. So that multiplication gives us negative 540 pi divided by 4 pi. Pi will cancel out from both the numerator and denominator. And if we do negative 540 divided by 4, we get negative 135 degrees. For our final example, we want to convert 73 degrees to radians, and it asks us to find an approximate answer. And when we're looking for an approximate answer, that means take whatever answer you get, put it in your calculator to evaluate it. If it asks for an exact answer, it means leave things in terms of pi. So we start with 73 degrees. To convert it to radians, we're going to multiply by pi divided by 180. So that gives us 73 pi divided by 180. This is our exact answer. We can't reduce it any further. But if we want an approximate answer, we can put this in our calculator, and that'll give us approximately 1.27 radians. So there are two ways that we can deal with writing an angle that is in degrees. We can either write it as a decimal, or we can break it down into degree, minute, second format. See, there are 60 seconds in a minute, and there are 60 minutes in a degree, so we can write things down with the number of degrees, the number of minutes, and the number of seconds. And we should be able to convert between these two notations. So let's look at an example where we convert to decimal degree notation. We're given an angle that measures 19 degrees, 47 minutes, and 23 seconds. So the single apostrophe denotes minutes, and the double apostrophe denotes seconds. So to convert this to decimal notation, we want to first divide the number of seconds by 60 and move that decimal to the minutes column. So we divide 23 seconds by 60, which gives us 0.38, and we move that into the minutes column. So now we have 19 degrees and 47.38 minutes. Next, we want to divide the number of minutes by 60 and move that into the degree column. So we're going to have 19 degrees as well as 47.3 divided by 60. That's our minutes divided by 60. And 47.38 divided by 60 gives us 0.79. So we have 19.79 degrees. For our next example, we want to go the other way. We want to convert from decimal notation to degree minute second notation. So we're given an angle that measures 67.84 degrees. So the first thing that we want to do is multiply the decimal in this angle by 60 and move that to the minutes column. So if we multiply the decimal 0.84 by 60, we get 50.4. And so that'll give us 67 degrees and 50.4 minutes. Now we want to multiply the decimal in the minutes column by 60 
and move that result to the seconds column. So the decimal in our minutes column is 0 0.4. If we multiply that by 60, that'll give us 24, which we move to the seconds column. So we have an angle that measures 67 degrees, 50 minutes, and 24 seconds. Next, we want to talk about finding arc length. So for a circle of radius r, a central angle of measure theta, radians, subtends an arc, so that just means surrounds an arc, whose length, s, is given by the formula s equals r times theta. So there's a picture here that represents the circle and the sector, that the, the angle that's inside the circle. And so the red, red portion of the circle denoted by s is the arc whose length we can find using this formula. Now note, in this formula, theta has to be in radians. So let's look at a couple of examples dealing with arc length. First, we want to find the length of the arc created when a circle of radius 6 feet has a central angle of 2 radians. So let's identify what we know. r is equal to 6 feet, theta equals 2 radians, and the arc length s is what we're looking for. So we're going to use our formula, s equals r times theta. We plug in the values that we know, so s equals 6 times 2. If we simplify that, we get s equals 12 feet. So the arc length is going to be 12 feet. All right, for a second example, let's find the measure of the central angle, which subtends an arc of length 8 meters in a circle of radius 6 meters. So again, let's identify what we know. r is equal to 6 meters. Theta is what we're looking for. And s is equal to 8 meters. So if we start with our arc length formula, s equals r times theta. We plug in the values that we know, so 8 equals 6 times theta. To solve for theta, we'll divide both sides by 6, so theta equals 8 over 6. And if we reduce the fraction, we get theta equals 4 thirds, so theta should equal 4 thirds radians. So the last thing that we're going to talk about in this section is finding the area of the sector of a circle. So using the same figure that we looked at for arc length, if we consider the area that's surrounded by the angle and the arc, s, that little wedge of the circle is called a sector. And the formula for the area of a sector is given by a equals one-half r squared theta. So let's look at a couple of examples. First, let's find the area of the sector created by a circle of radius six feet that has a central angle of two radians. We'll start by identifying what we know, so r equals six feet theta equals 2 radians, and the area is what we're looking for. Using that formula, a equals 1 half r squared theta, we plug in the values that we know, so a equals 1 half times 6 squared, and if we evaluate and simplify that, we'll get a equals 36 square feet. And finally, we want to find the radius of the circle that creates a sector of area 6 centimeters squared with a central angle of 1 fourth radians. So again, we start by figuring out what we know. We don't know r, so that's what we're looking for. Theta is equal to 1 fourth radians. Our area a is equal to 6 square centimeters. We're going to use the formula for the area of the sector, so a equals 1 half r squared theta. Plug in the things that we know, and we get 6 equals 1 half times r squared times 1 fourth. So we multiply both sides of the equation by 8. That'll give us 48 equals r squared. To solve for r, we'll take the square root of both sides, so r equals the square root of 48. And to simplify that radical, we want to factor it out into a perfect square times something else. So 48 can be thought of as the square root of 16 times 3. And we can pull the 16 out of the square root sign, giving us r equals 4 times the square root of 3 feet.